Hi, we're going to start off an activity you might have seen, depending on which teacher you have. I know whenever my class comes in and sees us up on the board, their face just lights up with the opportunity to write down 12 different answers on a whiteboard. We've got four columns here, and each column has a different set of points, depending on how difficult the questions are. On the left hand side, we've got questions from the last few lessons. On the right hand side, we've got things which you haven't learned about since maybe October, when we're looking at the medicine course. So pause the video and try to get as many of these answers as possible. The next slide will have all of the answers for you. I always say as a rough rule of thumb, if you can get 15 marks out of 30, that's a really solid score to be going on with. So these are the answers. These sorts of questions are mixed up. You'll always have some things which you should always definitely remember and then some things which would be really, really good too. So for example, the one at the top right, you need to know about Pasteur's germ theory. You need to know that it's in 1861. It's probably the most important day in the entire medicine course. However, for question B, if you don't remember that planes are landing every 90 seconds during the Berlin blockade, you could still get full marks in any Berlin blockade question. So it's a mix of things which you should know and things which will impress the examiner with precise factual detail. So we're going to go on to this lesson. We're going to have a look at a corpse to start off this cheerful lesson. Have a think about who this person might be and what it might mean for the Cold War. So this is in fact Joseph Stalin. So he was the Soviet leader. From 1924, when Lenin died, to 1953. Now, his death was slightly unfortunate for him. Well, obviously, it's very unfortunate for him. But the manner of his death was very peculiar. As a dictator, as a fearful man, he had very strict instructions to the guards and the people inside of his house not to interrupt him until they heard him in the morning moving around. He liked his beauty sleep, apparently. Now, unfortunately for him, during the night, he suffered a stroke in which he was semi-paralyzed and kind of a semi-conscious state. And his guards and his workers didn't come in until late in the afternoon. So he was found semi-conscious, covered in his own urine, trying to get out of bed. He died a few days later. If you want to see a comedic version of this horrible event, you can look at the death of Stalin, which has a lot of swear words in it, but it is a relatively semi-historical idea of what happened with all the power struggles around him. The point is, this man had ruled the Soviet Union for 19 years. For 19 years, he'd been basically unchecked. Because he was the man of steel, that's what Stalin means in Russian, he had been dictatorial, he had complete control, but he'd been so fearful about being replaced that he never let anyone discuss who would replace him after he died. This led to a power struggle between many leading Soviets or many leading members of the Communist Party. There's a weird thing where in our course, there's a Soviet leader you will never need to mention. It's the guy on the right tip, gleefully holding up a pile of corn. We've got Georgi Malenkov. Technically, or at least in most ways, he was the leader of the Soviet Union between 1953 and 1955. But within that period, his powers are stripped away from him and the undisputed leader from 1955 becomes this man, Nikita Khrushchev, or Khrushchev. Now, he will be the leader from 1955 until he is removed from power in 1964. So he is the only Soviet leader which you need to know about in our course who is removed from power. Again, ignoring Malenkov, every other Soviet leader on our course either dies or the last Soviet leader simply stops being the leader of the Soviets because there is no Soviet Union anymore. So we've got our first two leaders, which you must know about Stalin and then Khrushchev or sometimes Khrushchev in the more appropriate Russian pronunciation. So this lesson, we're going to be looking at how did Khrushchev change the USSR? So he is leader for nine years, much shorter than Stalin, but longer than others. In those nine years, he will change the USSR, he will change the Cold War in many different ways. This first lesson is going to focus on the ways in which he kind of changed it for the better. But within a few short years, he'll almost cause World War Three. So definitely a C minus in his report card. So we're going to be making notes about how Khrushchev changed the USSR and how he tried to change its relationship with the West. There are two key historical terms you need to know for this course. Peaceful coexistence and de-Stalinization. 
So we'll look at the first one first. Peaceful obviously means not wanting to fight, not wanting to engage in a war. Coexistence, if you're not sure, means living together. Now, if you think about Stalin's relationship with the West, they were willing to work together to defeat the Nazis. However, as soon as the Nazis were defeated, they were trying to take over capitalist and democratic areas, at least in Eastern Europe, if not the rest of the world. Before Stalin, there was Lenin, who would argue that the entire world needs to be communist, otherwise communism will never be safe. And Stalin would certainly agree to that, at least to an extent. Khrushchev, on the other hand, says, well, there's no reason why these two can't peacefully coexist. If you think about Britain and America right now, for example, there's two different versions of democracy. Certainly Britain is more socialist than America, and these two can work together. They can be incredibly strong allies. Khrushchev's point in the mid-1950s was that this could be the same of capitalism and communism altogether. So we should avoid war at all costs. But that doesn't mean we can't compete in a friendly way. Looking at how the USSR did compete with the USA, there are three main ways. First of all, you have the space race. Now, every single person knows, I hope, Neil Armstrong was the first man on the moon. He was an American. He did that in 1969. However, what most people tend to forget is that the USSR beat the Americans in every other milestone up to that point. They were the first country to launch a satellite to orbit the world. You can see a picture of Sputnik there. They were the first country to launch animals into space, such as Laika the dog, who unfortunately did not make it back. They were also the first country to launch the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin, in 1961. Now, in terms of the arms race, Khrushchev has no intention of scaling that back down. He's got pressure from America, who isn't slowing their arms race. He's also got pressure within the USSR. If he was to reduce the amount of weapons that his country had, he'd probably be removed from power as a traitor to the Soviet Union. In any case, in 1957, the USSR launches the first ICBM, or Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. So these ICBMs could launch from Moscow and hit a place like Paris or London. They're not far enough to hit uh, Washington DC from the Soviet Union. For that, they'd need a country, let's say Cuba, off the coast of Florida, to be sympathetic to them so they could place their ICBMs and then blow up America. And that would lead to the Cuban Missiles Crisis in 1962. The year before, in 1961, the USSR detonates the most powerful atomic bomb ever actually tested, the Tsar bomb, or the King of Bombs. Since 1961, both sides have made even more powerful weapons, but this is the most powerful weapon that's actually been tested. Now, on a much more peaceful side, you've got the continued role of propaganda. The most famous example of that would be sports competitions like the Olympics. So the USSR had competed in nine Summer Olympics and nine Winter Olympics. They were incredibly successful at both of them. They poured millions and millions of dollars or rubles into making sure that their athletes were as well trained and often quite doped up on steroids to compete and embarrass the Americans. And it did work. For the nine Summer Olympics that they competed in, six of them they came first in, the other three they came second, with obviously America coming in first. And then outside of the Olympics, outside of sports events, Soviet newspapers, either state owned or semi state owned, would continue to criticize capitalism and democracy and America specifically whenever America would do something which would be potentially embarrassing. Now, in terms of how successful peaceful coexistence was, the mere fact that Khrushchev attended summits or what you might call conferences in two different years is a clear decision that he made to show that he's willing to coexist peacefully. Stalin hadn't attended a conference with the Western powers since Potsdam. So for the next eight years of his life, he would refuse to meet those Western leaders. Khrushchev, one of the very first things he does will be to attend one of those summits, in particular over the Austrian problem. Now, Austria had been occupied just like Germany had at the end of World War II, and they had been split in the same way that Germany had. And if you have a look at the map at the bottom, deep in the heart of the Soviet zone, you can see Vienna split in exactly the same way as Berlin had been split. In 1955, both sides signed the Austrian State Treaty, which meant that all countries would take their soldiers out of the occupied zones. Austria would remain a neutral country, which it still technically does today. On the other hand, because the arms race continued, you'd never say that there was no tension between the two. And Khrushchev will be more than happy to 
flex the USSR's muscles, either with threats or actual invasions. So there's threats against Polish demonstrations in 1956. And as we'll see in the next lesson, the Soviets will invade a communist country, Hungary, in 1956. And finally, in 1961, the Berlin Wall will specifically split up East and West Berlin. They will not be reunified for more than three decades afterwards. Finally, in the exact same year as the Austrian State Treaty, a masterstroke in diplomacy on both sides, Khrushchev will set up the Warsaw Pact, which we've spoken about in a previous lesson. So it's a defensive pact for communist countries in response to West Germany joining NATO. Now, as a stretch and challenge which you might want to think about, the Austrian State Treaty is not a massive section in our course. But if you ever asked to consider about the Berlin blockade or how these two countries or leaders are working with each other or working against each other, it might be worth thinking about why was Austria so peacefully negotiated, whereas Stalin and Truman had the Berlin blockade and airlift. Think, how does that show that the Berlin blockade was a failure of diplomacy? Or you might argue that the two countries and the two cities are just too different from each other, so it's not fair to compare the two. Now, we're looking at the second section of Khrushchev's new policies, de-Stalinisation. So de-Stalinisation obviously implies getting rid of some things which Stalin did. Now, to begin with, this de-Stalinisation was supposed to be secret. Khrushchev gave a secret speech, in fact it's called the secret speech, to high-ranking members of the Communist Party. This was not supposed to be something which the wider world would know about, but within a few months, every single person who wanted to find out about it in the West could find out about it. But because there was still censorship in the East, there was a weird situation where the beneficiaries, the people who benefited from this secret speech, may not have known it had happened for many years afterwards. In any case, he gave this long speech from notes. His main points were that Stalin's control of both the Soviet Union, the USSR, and Eastern Europe had been too strict. In particular, many millions of people in these areas had been sent to gulags, political prisons, where many would disappear without any sort of warning. They'd been given hard labor, or maybe just killed in a summary execution. Because Stalin had been too strict, it only made sense for millions of these to be released from those political prisons. He will still keep them, but they'll be massively underused compared to Stalin. He also said that Eastern Europe would be more free to make their own decisions. Now, that's not the same as the Soviet Union. Remember, the Soviet Union is not Russia. It's Russia plus 13 other countries, places like Estonia or Ukraine or Belarus. But Eastern European countries like Hungary or Poland would be allowed to have a greater degree of freedom. The best demonstration of this is the abolition of the common form set up by Stalin. But on the other hand, the Commie Con and the Warsaw Pact would remain. So some historians would say that you shouldn't really use the common form as evidence of Khrushchev being a nicer, more free person, because the common form has kind of become unnecessary. Because you've got the Commie Con to regulate their economies, and you've got the Warsaw Pact to regulate their militaries, you don't particularly need the common form to regulate their foreign policy. Because between the economy and the military, you've got that country secure anyway. His final promise was just generally to improve the living standards of Eastern Europeans by producing more consumer goods. So that could be as basic as a wider variety of shoes or coats or sorts of things or um, consumer goods such as foods. Or it could be trying to get access to things like colour televisions, which will soon become uh, available to the upper classes of the communists. Now, this speech was truly shocking. If you think that Stalin was the dictator of the Soviet Union for 19 years, and since World War II, he'd extended that control over much of Eastern Europe, any whisper against Stalin had been treated with ruthlessly. But because the censorship had been so harsh, many members, even members of the Communist Party, were shocked to hear about how bad things had been under Stalin. So there are some reports of people um, either having heart attacks or just dying from suicide because they could not believe that they'd been involved in this sort of thing. Now, in terms of the results of the Stalinization, Khrushchev hadn't intended for the secret speech to be heard in the West, but because it had, you have the Khrushchev thought. 
Now, there's a weird thing in the Cold War. Remember, it's called a Cold War because it's not a hot war. They're not actually fighting. So historians will talk about a thaw in the Cold War, which means that it's becoming less cold. It's warming up. But that's a good thing. So the Khrushchev thaw saw improved relations between the USA and the USSR at least until 1960. And we'll look in a future lesson as to why things started to get so much worse. Another result of desalinization is especially with the abolition of the common form. Even if Khrushchev didn't want Eastern Europe to be free, it made Eastern Europeans think that he was OK with it. But because he has no intention of completely relaxing his grip on Eastern Europe, they will lead to tensions, as we'll look at in the next lesson, in Hungary. Now, don't stop the video just yet. You're not going to have to write this question, I promise. We're just going to have a look at the final type of question in the Cold War exam. You're just going to do a little bit of rearranging, just A, B, C, D, and then I'll show you what a model answer might look like. So you've looked at question one, which is explain two consequences of something. You've looked at question three, which is explain the importance of something for something else. The final one is the one in the middle. Write an analytic narrative explaining the key events of something. Now, an analytic narrative is a really weird phrase, which the exam board cooked up a few years ago. Essentially, they want you to tell a story in a step-by-step -step way. In other words, chronologically from beginning to end and showing why one thing led to the other. So if you're telling a story from beginning to end, you should have three clear paragraphs looking at the causes, then the events, then the results. And obviously you need to use as much precise detail as possible. So the vaguer you are, the lower your score. The more precise dates or statistics which you use, the better your score is likely to be. So we've got a range of different events here. What I'd like you guys to do is to put this into chronological order. So just on a bit of scrap paper, you can just put B, D, blah, 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 blah. There are a couple of things in here which aren't relevant to the question. So put them in chronological order and then think, would I actually include this? Is it answering the question which we want? If this is already too many events for you, just focus on the ones in red. Here are the answers then. So you notice we've started with a D, with Stalin closing all roads, tracks and canals in the Berlin blockade and airlift. And we're finishing with C, Khrushchev building the Berlin Wall. We'll cover that in a few lessons time. Because you haven't studied it yet, hopefully you were able to separate those two. But once you've learned about both, many students tend to think that they are done either for same reasons or same levers or similar periods. One's in 1948, one's in 1961. Two different leaders, two different causes, two different sets of results. So please, please, please try and keep those separate as much as possible. Hopefully you've all remembered my delightful story about a dictator being covered in urine. Feel free to include that in an exam if you want. I'm not sure you'll get too many marks for it, though, so I wouldn't try to obsess over that fact. In any case, we need to ignore the bit about D. It's not relevant to this question. I guess you can include the information about G, but you need to start at some point with Stalin dying. Khrushchev can't come to power unless Stalin has died. From that point onwards, you need to start to go through all of these in as much detail as possible. So we've got an idea about what an excellent first paragraph would look like. So we're not going to do anything more with this. I'm just going to walk you through a little bit more and we'll look at a question two in a future lesson. So you've got this chronology. So the first paragraph is all talking about the causes of these sorts of things. And then we'll go on to the events with this desalinization. And then his results might lead into the Berlin Wall, for example. You'll notice there are phrases in purple. These are what are called key phrases. According to the exam board, if you don't include these types of key phrases, you're not analysing the narrative. You're just describing the narrative. You're saying this happened, then this happened, then this happened. So for some ludicrous reason, you need these key phrases in to show that I know this thing is causing this thing. So as a result, therefore, leading to this led to anything like that. So that's all we're going to do on a question two. If you want to fill out the next two paragraphs, feel free. I'm sure your, par uh, your teacher would love to see those. But you don't need to do a third bit of exam practice just yet. So we're going to finally finish on a cartoon. I have no idea when this is made or even which country this is made. I assume it is a Western political cartoon. But just have a think about what this cartoon suggests about Khrushchev's rise to power. So we've got a little bit of extra information. If you're not sure, Limbo is a place between heaven and hell, sometimes called 
purgatory. We've got Khrushchev, you can see just on the hem of his trousers there, kicking Stalin down a set of stairs into a darkened room with other members of the Communist Party that Stalin had killed in his rise to power. So have a little bit think about that. Just think, what does that suggest about Khrushchev as a leader? What does it suggest about the Soviet Union's style of choosing its political leaders? So that's everything we've got for you today. So go back over this video, make sure your notes are as crystal clear as possible. You need those two clear phrases, peaceful coexistence and de with a good mixture of precise factual detail, all the good stuff. Thanks very much, guys.